Uh, you've been a two-time MLA. You've been in the government. You are national spokesperson for the major party like BJP. How do somebody make a career as a politician? Uh, talking of success and talking of elections, how do we see 2024 Lok Sabha elections spelling out? Or maybe Northeast in specific, how do you see these elections spelling out? I mean, there are so many uh, theories people come up with to decode the success of the BJP. Yeah. Uh, however, it is uh, very clear that Northeast, uh, especially the 1962 war, mm. uh, when China, Chinese mm -hmm. PLA with came till tasteful, yeah. like half of uh, yeah. central of Assam. Yeah. That time, Nehru just said, my heart goes out to the people of Assam. I mean, he should have been saying that. He should have been sending his uh, troops. Troops. Yeah. We as Indians haven't really read as much about the Battle of Kohima as we should. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have read about all the battles, you know, Plassey, Haldi Ghati, this, that. History going back to like thousand years. And this is pretty recent. For an empire to win a war against another empire. Yeah. And therefore I felt that their stories have been told. Their officers and soldiers have been glorified. True. They have been given medals which uh, oh, the Naga warriors won't get. But we have to tell our side of the story. Absolutely. So this is the first account. Uh, there's a question which is a little bit on the personal side. I mean, you may choose to not answer it. So in one of your interviews, I read that one of your books is about uh, your conversations with your wife when she was diagnosed with a terminal illness. Those are like very personal kind of conversations. So why did you choose to publish it? Like what was your thought? As in like, did it help you? process your loss. Namaskar and welcome to yet another episode of my podcast Inspiringly Yours. And in today's episode we have with us a truly multifaceted personality, Mr. Manolomo Krikon. And he is a multifaceted personality in the truest sense of the word. He's a poet, an author, a politician, uh, has authored multiple books. His latest book, His Majesty's Head Hunters, has been a bestseller. He is also the national spokesperson for BJP. He's also Pravari for Mizoram. Uh, it's truly an honor and a privilege to have you on the show, sir. My privilege. Thank you Thank very you much for having for, me. Thank you very much for taking your time out. And we are thankful that you have given us this opportunity to pick your brains on uh, with you, especially with the wide experience and expertise that you carry from different uh, fields. There's so much to talk about. Yeah. So, but I do realize we have limited time. So we'll have to, of course, prioritize and be a little selective. So let's start with the politician and then we'll move to the author and the poet. So, so first thing, uh, if uh, from you have been fairly successful as a politician uh, at a pretty young age, uh, you've been a two-time MLA, you've been in the government, you are national spokesperson for the major party like BJP. If you would tell few fundamentals or you know few basics to uh, take care of or to understand for anybody aspiring to be a politician, somebody who is a genuine sense of public service as well as genuine electoral aspirations. How do somebody make a career as a politician? Thank you for having me first. Um, it's a pleasure to be in your podcast. Thank you, sir. Um, in response to what you just asked, let me put it this way. Uh, There's a saying that you may not be interested in politics, yeah. but politics is always interested in me. Of course. Yeah. I feel that... Um, um, on a serious note, yeah. there are issues around you from the day you're born yeah. and from the day you uh, get your education the school and college, you're exposed to a lot of ideas and a lot of uh, issues in general, yeah. which affects your life. Yeah. So whatever impacts your life is uh, something which gives you direction yeah. because you have to respond yeah. to the challenges, to the uh, issues before you. Yeah. After my... Uh, education in the university when I went back home and looked at the issues around my um, especially it starts with uh, your roots 
So when I went back to my roots, which is the village, the uh, constituency I am from, yeah. there were challenges I saw which people faced. And I, as a genuine uh, son of the soil, interested in solving the problems of the region and the area I am from, yeah. I engaged myself with the locals and uh, the natives as they, um, uh, from my place. And that's how my politics started. It is not, or it was not with the intention of uh, joining electoral politics. Okay. But then you realize over time, when you work with people, that uh, the most effective way which will impact the change of the region, of the uh, issue, issues that you face, yeah. is true politics. Yeah. And yeah. politics is such a, a powerful and wonderful space. Yeah. If you are able to uh, work in the right way, yeah. it'll enable uh, the change to happen. True. So instead yeah. of waiting for it, I plunged into it and I would also add, uh, in response to your question, yeah. that uh, the principal basis for uh, any successful electoral career mm -hmm. is uh, uh, your constant focus on the issues which will impact your community and um, for us it was made easier uh, because now we live in the age of technology yeah. we, live in, uh, we live in a age where programs are designed from the center especially on the prime minister modi's government to reach the last mile whatever is being provided at the metros at the cities or in uh, Delhi or uh, other metros will also reach the rural sector. Yeah. For instance, you know, healthcare, uh, education, and um, even, you know, very basic things like water supply. Yeah. So when you are impacting the lives of the rural mass, and when you have programs like that, it's easier for you as agencies or, uh, you know, simple karyakartas, yeah to work for the service of your people. True. So politics, in a way, is actually meant for service to the people. True. And if you hold true to that vision, yeah. then it will be easy for anyone to succeed. Because again, the question of or the notion of success in politics may vary from people to people. True. Yeah. You may have an objective. Yeah. You may want to achieve that objective yeah. in social service. Yeah. But it may not be true electoral politics. It may not. It may be true party work. Yeah. Uh, a contribution can come from uh, any way. Okay. But uh, ultimately, is the objective, is the vision for your people that will drive you. Yeah. So if you have a clear vision of what you want to do for the betterment of your people, then I think uh, it is natural for you to thrive in uh, the field of politics. Okay. Essentially, politics is about social service it is i mean there are no there can be no two ways about it and of course one can have aspirations to grow but then um, the primary driving force has to be a sense of service yes that is so true and so well put uh, another question since you are a bjp leader pretty senior leader national spokesperson what differentiates the BJP from the other political parties? I mean, BJP is growing the way it is growing. In fact, in regions, uh, the whole of Northeast is <laughs> currently under the control of BJP as like BJP is in power in almost all the states. What is making it tick? Like, what is connecting with the people? Let me first put the perspective in this manner. The BJP actually is a pan-India phenomena. Phenomena, true, absolutely. Um, I think over the years, yeah. people have come to accept BJP as the party with a difference. True. Yeah. And uh, in spite and despite the uh, slogans that people identify as with, mm -hmm. it is the commitment of BJP leaders towards the people they serve that has actually sustained the political success of the party. And we have uh, visionary leaders who work day in and day out without any break, any holiday yeah, yeah. 
24-7 for the welfare of the people. If you remember, initially when Prime Minister Modi became the Prime Minister of India, expectations were high. True. But yeah. he delivered. Yeah. Because he came with a lot of welfare programs which were lacking in the country. Yeah. And one thing which he said, which really changed uh, the mindset of the people from Northeast region, is that India cannot be called a developed country, mm-hmm. or India cannot develop if the Northeast does not develop. Absolutely. He actually put Northeast at the center of Indian growth story. Mm-hmm. And that messaging is not just political messaging. Okay. In for 10 years, from 2004 to 2014, mm-hmm. UPA was in power. They also did a lot of things. Yeah. But the Prime Minister, who was a Rajya Sabha member for Massa, yeah. came to Nagaland in his 10 years as Prime Minister only once. Okay. And that is also for the election, election. Lok Sabha election. Okay. He didn't come to Nagaland state yeah. for even once. And that is when he was a Rajya Sabha member from that state. From Notice. From Northeast. Yeah, from Assam. From Assam. But anyway, yeah. I mean, uh-huh. taken together. Yeah. It is from the same region. Yeah. So the intention, the concern was uh, clear to everyone. Yeah. Whereas Prime Minister came to all the notice of state yeah. from day one. Yeah. Not only that, he ensured that all the union ministers yeah. visit northeastern states every month. Every month, yeah. From not having union ministers visit our state, yeah. we were now handling multiple visits of union ministers. Yeah. But what it does is, yeah. governance in, cen- in the center yeah. is directly impacted by the issues in the margins. Yeah, true. Yeah. And the borders in the northeastern region yeah. is, uh, uh, you know, because we share uh, international borders with five different countries, yeah. the borders are very sensitive. Yeah. So strengthening our borders yeah. means strengthening the country. So his nation building agenda was very clear. How to implement that, how to actually achieve that was also very clear. Vision was clear to begin with. Then his engagement with the region. So people got a sense that yes, BJP means business. BJP wants to bring peace and development in the region. For a long time, region was known for conflicts, for violence yeah. and any media coverage was always uh, so you know focused on that yeah. Always, yeah but today we see that things have changed yeah things have changed we have brought a lot of change in our approach to uh, uh, peace in the region yeah. there have a lot of uh, agreements have been signed yeah. peace accords have been signed yeah. and uh, comparatively if you look at 2004 to 14 and 14 to 2024, the scale of development has been immensely high. Okay. For instance, let me take the example of uh, Arunachal Pradesh. Okay. From zero airports in Arunachal Pradesh, yeah. now within these 10 years, there are nine airports. Nine airstrips. Like nine the, airports. Yeah. Proper airports oh, yeah. uh, and uh, airstrips. So, under Prime Minister Modi's vision, connectivity has improved so much in the notice. Road sector, there was a special purpose vehicle created called the National Highway Infrastructural Development Corporation Limited under the Ministry of uh, Road Transport. And it ensured that roads are built in all the states, irrespective of, uh, you know, Whichever government was there in the past. But no now, bias towards no that. Bias. Yeah, no. So when it came to development, there is no bias. Prime Minister knows only the agenda of developing the region. So, I mean, imagine for even a state like Nagaland. In my whole adult life, I have not seen a four-lane road. Seriously? Seriously, because there is no four-lane road. Then, uh, of course, because but no now, road. we have a four-lane road. Okay. Not just one. Yeah, multiple. Uh, yeah. I mean, 
and 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 the fact that the rural sector the far off places yeah. uh, from for instance the uh, state uh, capital yeah. are also being connected with two lane four lane four lane yeah. you know it's 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 like a miracle we are seeing in our lifetime so it impacts the mindset of the uh, electorate yeah. and people know that prime minister is concerned yeah. prime minister knows about them and prime minister cares about them yeah. and i mean prime minister being the face of the government of course yeah the government so yeah. you see this development has been repeated in all the states of the northeast so whatever may have been uh, you know the party ruling the states in the past yeah. today there is a very clear message that people are sending yeah. they are electing uh, bjp government or bjp led coalition Calling government, government yeah. so the region has benefited immensely okay. from the party's policies towards yeah. Uh, our region. I'll just tell you one example again. Um, there's a 80-year-old woman in my constituency who I went and met mm-hmm. in 2013, mm-hmm. and uh, uh, to seek for her vote mm-hmm. and support during in the election. Mm-hmm. So she told me, "Please don't come. Mm-hmm. You fetch water from the uh, river, well, okay, river, or the well, yeah. and uh, put it in my uh, drum, yeah. and I'll vote for you." So drinking water in the villages was a problem. There was no tap water drinking facility in the village. Yeah. But under uh, Jal Jivan, Jal Jivan, yeah, true. Today we have achieved more than seventy percent uh, of uh, rural water, uh, rural uh, tap water, tap water, tap water connection. Yeah. And the next election when I went, yeah. they gave me lunch, yeah. and I had to wash my hand in the basin in the kitchen, kitchen yeah. because there is tap water in the yeah. kitchen now. Yeah. they don't have to walk kilometers yeah. to fetch water yeah. so when you know the basic problem my constituency was also that you have this uh, health issue yeah. usually there is no money for uh, health uh, you know because the health care is a basic yeah. so in order when you have a big crisis usually you you sell your land yeah true i mean somebody falls sick exactly. in the family you and, end and, up selling uh, your... for higher education you you do the same thing you yeah, sell your land true So what has happened is under NEP policy, under new education policy, under uh, you know Ayushman Bharat, you get insurance. Yeah, absolutely. So even the politicians problems are uh, solved yeah. from there because you're getting so much insurance yeah. for healthcare treatment. Yeah. So you know the entire general well-being and welfare of the rural mass yeah. has been impacted by policies which are well thought out. This prime minister himself knows. first hand what are the problems being faced by the people so when you know you are able to make policies which will improve their well being and their life yeah. so that is the miracle that transformed people's perception and opinion of the bjp everywhere and true that is by the virtue of the pm coming from a very humble background then spending a like good long time with the rss actually working at the grassroots as a party carder so of course he is like first hand experience you know he has seen all of it and then of course there is intent to fix it uh, people might have experience but there are still people who might not have intent so there is intent of course and that of course is pretty visible in the kind of love and support he is getting from the but add to that uh, the hard work he puts in yeah okay so so that is something why i wanted to ask about yeah so you have worked with all the top bjp leaderships and you know um uh, amit shah mr modi and others and there's this perception that we have or at least this is what we've been told that they work really hard and you know non stop at uh, 24 by 7 so what is it like because since you've worked with them i mean just want to know from your experience what is their personality like how do they think and see if you have uh, some anecdotes yeah. the little that i know yeah from my Uh, from the various programs we uh, have uh, you know program. i'll just give you one example yeah. for instance we have the national executive meeting okay it's a two day meeting of the national executive the office bearers and the leaders of the party you yeah. and we have a discussion on various topics which are of concern for the party okay in the service of the nation our prime minister 
sits through the entire two days from morning till evening listening to everybody and only on the second day he also gives his opinion and shares and reflects so when you have somebody who listens to every career cut yeah. it is natural that he knows the pulse of the people true and he he is very much aware of you know uh, what the challenges faced by the party mm. what are the vision or the next level uh, next step that we have to take is because of that kind of engagement so in my um observation from all the programs they have it's for all to see not just uh, yeah, as a bjp yeah, leader yeah. but you know they are always their presence is always published uh, published on whether it's on social media platforms yeah. or in uh, other media so it's very evident that for any issue for any program they are always present yeah. whenever they are needed or depending on the programs likewise all the other ministers are also like that everyone is very hard working everyone is dedicated to their job you will not see that in other parties maybe yeah but as far as my party leaders are concerned the focus is clear not just the intent but the actual drive yeah. to deliver to the goods is seen by the people so hard work is natural that the drive is pretty evident and visible yeah i mean i see bjp working as more like a corporation and not really in the crony capitalistic sense of the word but the uh, the efficiency point of view i'm talking about you know really aggressive uh, in the in the field all the time, all the time i mean they'll have one election one that election but still they'll be like planning for the next one uh, so that is in a stark difference to the other opposing parties that much i mean i'm not a really politician don't not really doesn't really belong to bjp but but that much i can see and i can sort of you know say publicly and maybe that is what has helped the bjp uh, to become what it has become i mean there are so many uh, theories people come up with to decode the success of the bjp yeah uh, however it is very clear that once your vision is clear for the nation yeah. and for the country i think uh, a committed leader whose vision is clear will feel the need to deliver and so that actually drives them to work so that passion yeah. Uh, yeah yeah so i feel that in my uh, experience uh, the obligation is there the commitment is there and there is this drive to respond to every issue that the need of the state the need of the nation the need of uh, the citizens are taken into account and that's what drives them so you know uh, people may say we are like the corporate we function like that no i mean uh, there's a thin line uh, which is blurry also but let me not break it uh, the efficiency of the party from that perspective okay it's just that people are committed therefore they are efficient yeah because that drive is there that drive is inside there. so you know when your karyakarta is having problems somewhere because he is not he is selfless he is working for the people too so when he calls you you respond why because you feel that you are for the same cause yeah to serve the people too so in serving the people i think the attempt has been very clean okay. and we have been successful because um let us put it in a very simple manner for us there is no rest till everest there is no rest till everest this is very nice you know yeah uh, nice thought and nice nicely put actually nail uh, fantastic uh, talking of success and talking of elections how do you see 2024 lok sabha elections spelling out i mean though i am no political analyst but as an ordinary voter to me it is a foregone con- conclusion okay it is like you know the nda is forming a government back again but still from your perspective if you could throw your perspective and share it with us like uh, from the pan india perspective or maybe northeast in specific how do you see these elections panning out i think i agree with you yeah uh, people have reposed their faith in the leadership of our prime minister and in the 
leadership of BJP. True. And uh, we have seen in the present elections in Rajasthan itself, yeah. people were predicting this and that. But I think uh, the popularity of our Prime Minister is at its highest. Yeah. And people have faith in you. So when your countrymen have faith in you, mm. I think it's very clear. We don't have to even discuss the pros and cons. Mm. Uh, that doesn't mean that we don't work. We do our homework uh, in a very detailed, meticulous manner. Everyone is working hard mm. in every constituency, every mandal, every block. Every block. So it's not as, as if it's just the leadership saying this and yeah. that. Everyone is committed. So there is this uh, coordination which exists. And there is this uh, hard work which is put in by every Karyakarta. So BJP is a party of committed Karyakarta. And therefore, there has been a continuous attempt to ensure that we work for the people. That has been recognized. So I think the main basis for why we are very confident uh, to win the 2024 Lok Sabha election is because uh, we have delivered. Yeah. And people have faith in that. Simple as that. True. 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 And uh, one more question that is, I like was watching some of your interviews and somewhere you said that an average Delhi guy is more comfortable with the US map than the Northeast map. And I have to, you know, I'm also guilty of that, honestly, and I'll take that blame, blame with them, I ignore this. So, we don't know about Northeast as much as we should, ideally, you know, at least this part of the country. So, in brief, if you could tell us, what is it about Northeast that an average Indian should know, which you don't? I mean, of course, it's a very wide and broad yeah, question. I, I mean, it's very difficult to put it into a paragraph or a few sentences, but still, I mean, what are their... Uh, what is the culture like? What are the people's challenges, aspirations? Are, like, are they just like us in terms of their challenges and aspirations or are there any specific challenges and aspirations that they face? So India is a big country. True. And uh, our population is very yeah. high. We are the biggest. The biggest <laughs> in the world. So it's natural that uh, there will be people from every state who doesn't know um, much about the other state as well. Yeah. It's not just the Northeast. But Northeast being um, in a region where you have to fly over Bangladesh airspace to reach yeah. if you want to go there. And uh, by train, of course, you have to cross the chicken neck. Yeah. So it, it is a region where it is not permanently on the, you know, uh, mind of... Yeah. Uh, Top of the mind recall, it's not part of, of India. daily yeah. conversations. Yeah. So most of the time, and especially in the past... Uh, Northeast came in the news only when there was violence, there was so, some insurgency, uh, insurgency related uh, information, news. But it changed uh, since 2014 because starting from Delhi, Delhi is the capital of India. Of course. So, you know, in Delhi, uh, there were a lot of uh, harassment uh, issues faced by students from Northeast who mm. comes to uh, Delhi in uh, huge numbers to study. And Delhi has that attraction. And, and, uh, the way the Prime Minister sold that is, is sensitize the whole country. So it can only happen at that level and scale. Yeah. So he went to notice every year, um, yeah. almost to every state, yeah. uh, every time. And then and once he, he goes, he, obviously his exactly. no, deputies and ministers and everything. Not only that, the yeah. media is after of course, yeah. where he goes. Yeah, true. So and, and true. That he, gets he actually... Climate. If you look at him, he will always be wearing a waistcoat from uh, the Naga community yeah. or, you know, the headgear. Or, or so, the kind of perception he has created yeah. and the kind of attention he has given yeah. has ensured that people from uh, a, a populous state like uh, UP, yeah. you know, uh, you would know that there are 80 Lok Sabha seats. Yeah. True. Sorry, the biggest one. It's a huge yeah. state. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, you won't expect everyone to know about Northeast. But now, it's because of his uh, energy, because of his passion in promoting the region. Now, that lack of, or that sense of alienation is over. So he's reduced that. So in the past, because I've said geographically, it's a little far away. Yeah. It's uh, never been in the mainstream in a mm -hmm. big way. You know, uh, and he has not, and then now uh, we have ensured that, I mean, Prime Minister has ensured that there is equal representation in the ministry, even the union ministry. Yeah. 
and uh, prominent uh, uh, opportunities have been given to people from the northeastern region. Mm -hmm. So this policy has changed that disconnect. So mm -hmm. on hindsight, we know that it was because of the neglect by of the course. center. So when you actually give priority, yeah. when uh, you, you centralize a region which is supposedly in the margins, yeah. then I think things and Change. perception changes. Change. So it's about perception, it's about development, and it's about implementation of policies. It's not just dialogue, it's not yeah. just political no. No, speeches, posturing. Not posturing. Not yeah. yeah, because you see, Northeast, uh, especially the 1962 war, mm. uh, when China, Chinese mm -hmm. PLA with came till Tispur, yeah. like half of uh, yeah. central of Assam. Yeah. That time Nehru just said, my heart goes out to the people of Assam. I mean, he shouldn't have been saying that. He should have been sending his what? troops. Troops, you know. So I think there was no preparation. There were some uh, huge blunder on their part. Yeah. And now that thing is not there. There's a book know? called the Himalayan blunder. So now if you look at the region, those days there, there was a thinking that if you develop the roads in northeast, and if China invades, they yeah. will take away. So they won't take, develop. Yeah. So, I mean, what kind of what, uh, exactly uh, thinking is that? Today is not like that. Today you will go to every nook and corner in northeast from not having roads. Yeah. Now, uh, sports cars can come and play in okay. the region, right? especially uh, now major roads have been called. So the transformation has been real. Roads definitely is one of Modi government's biggest achievement. I mean, it of is. course, pan India. I mean, pan India, yeah. Network, the, the infrastructure, the road network that they created, it's mm. fabulous. I mean, today, if I have to go from place A to place B, there is a highway which exists. No, you go to go to Assam okay. in Dibugar. There's a river bank um, no, by, known by the name Bokibil Khat. Okay. So we used to, in 2010, we used to go by uh, row, uh, by car and uh, from the Khat, we used to get up on a board mm -hmm. and we used to travel one hour to go to another, across the bank, another district called okay. Dhamaji. Okay. That's right. Yeah. Now, he has built the longest bridge. Yeah. And I can cross that river, yeah. which used to take me one hour in five minutes. Five minutes. True. So this has been the change. Connectivity is also one enabling uh, factor of, course, yeah. of regional integration. Yeah. Absolutely. And, you know, because there's immense traffic, there's yeah. immense people's to people's yeah. uh, connection Connected, now yeah. because of that. Yeah accessibility to other states yeah. with the roads and all that. So in terms of the quality of life, yeah. all these developments have ensured that it has progressed. There are some hiccups here and yeah, there. Of course, yeah. yeah. But, you yeah. know, Rome was not built in a day. Yeah. But development of North, North East has definitely uh, happened in leaps and bounds. Yeah. Nice. Good to know that. Mm. And I do intend to travel there soon. You I mean, must come. Uh, this is, I know where I lived there as a kid mm. in Arunachal in Assam. Mm. My father was with the army, so we nice lived in know. Chansari, Misamari in Assam, mm. and I lived in uh, uh, Tenga mm. in Arunachal. Oh. Yeah. But that was like long back. I was a kid, like fourth standard, fifth standard kind of. Yeah. Yeah. Like good long thirty years back. If you come now, you will see the changes. I, I'll have, mm. but have to and definitely look forward to it. One thing that I like about Northeast. Uh, I find their politicians to be pretty chilled out. Mm. As in like, uh, they have chief ministers, say for example, Meghalaya chief minister. Conrad Sangma. Yeah, yeah. Sang, Mr. Sangma. He'll play guitar and mm. sing and you know, and then uh, uh, your state's ex-BJP chief, mm. he'll make self-deprecating humor and you know, he'll yeah. make fun of himself and he's, he's again chilled out. Uh, like a good self, you write poetry, such beautiful poetry. Thank you. But in, in North, I mean, and especially, I can talk about North since I live here. You know, the typical politician is of a angry, grumpy, old uncle, or maybe they walk around with some kind of a halo around their head, you know, just thinking of themselves a little too much, taking themselves a little too seriously. So why is that difference? Or is it just in my perception or it actually difference? Or is it a cultural thing? If it is, then is it a cultural thing? Are like all people chilled out there? Or is it just the politician? Just want to sort of maybe, you know, uh, have your thoughts on it. The 
fact is we cannot generalize of course i on, understand on, yeah on everybody i yeah. mean uh, people are different different cultures have different uh, motivations and uh, therefore different personalities leading you know the people i would not specifically say okay. that it is uh, you know just the northeastern political leaders okay. who are uh, relaxed and yeah i mean who who come across as chill relaxed yeah. it is you see i've been thinking the same way yeah. but then my perception changed because i realized that in the bjp yeah you have ministers mps mlas chief ministers who are readily accessible yeah accessibility is the key okay because it's it's about performance it's about serving the people and if the party feels that you are not accessible yeah you are behaving like a you know Uh, some politician who are uh, power unto themselves yeah i think that is not appreciated in the party okay so party as a whole as uh, uh, you know politicians public uh, you know ministers mlas who are accessible to everybody yeah. so that culture has changed nationally okay and coming back to the region of course we have uh, chief ministers who are super busy mm. of course because uh, by virtue of the responsibility they hold of course mm. but then uh, like you said they also know how to oh. chill okay. yeah we have uh, music is an integral part of northeast culture as well exactly so, i mean i think it's integral part of a part of every culture, every culture but, but uh, uh, in the northeast uh, uh, it's encouraged to play an instrument or two okay uh, right from your childhood, uh, childhood. Oh, so sure. i think it if if uh, that station plays a guitar yeah. it's considered normal uh-huh. yeah yeah it's considered normal oh, yeah. but uh, then again you have another level of uh, skill which uh, conrad some uh, you know normally displays yeah. yeah. or if you look at kiran rijju you know he's so fit yeah he is uh, cycling or climbing mountains yeah. going to the snow and uh, show- showcasing yeah. uh, his uh, you know a pro is in one sport or the other yeah. it comes naturally to you so it's it's just a hobby which they display it's just that because of social media now of you can see, see what yeah. they are doing and it's educative and it's also yeah. instructive yeah. because it enables people to see a, pers- a politician yeah in a different in a more human in a form. more human more yeah so form, yeah. that makes it easier to work yeah. uh, with people yeah. and for people so i feel that uh, one cannot generalize uh, politicians from elsewhere okay. but uh, i will say that uh, you know maybe it's part of the culture okay uh, but as a hobby if you develop mm. then you have time to also express mm. uh, mm. and uh, i think uh, politicians from every state have their own respective talents okay but yeah. also in terms of population you have uh, the population is less in the region yeah and and sometimes uh, uh it's not as maybe uh it's not as heavy or taxing as serving uh, you know as ball city as compared yeah as compared to big state you know True. so that may be one factor maybe yeah that that workload takes away but at the end of the day you cannot be generalized true that is true of course uh, generalization is not you know is not justified it is just not because practical. you see today if i see somebody from north yeah. or south india if you are arrogant if you are unapproachable yeah. i think you face uh, electoral defeat in the uh, elections yeah. next election true and it's it's evident in this uh, already you know in, in front of you yeah. there's so many stories of yeah. uh, uh, big names yeah, actually yeah. just falling by the side yeah especially you know uh, during the election during the elections yeah. true so sir enough of the political discussion and uh, I genuinely want to talk about your writing. You know, you have uh, written some fabulous books. Uh, there are at least four books that I know of, and there might be more. Uh, your latest book is His Majesty's Headhunters, and this is about the siege of Koima during World War II, and it's a fabulous read. I read it. Uh, so, to to begin with, how did writing happen to you? I think what made you a writer, or you before just tell something about us. I was since oh. I was uh, young. i wanted to be a writer so it has been you know when you are young people you know your uncles aunties or 
relatives ask you, yeah. what do you want to become when you grow yeah. up? Sure. I always say that I want to be a writer. Yeah. Uh, because I was fascinated with writing and, and because I read a lot. Yeah. So it was always there in the back of my mind. And, and I started literature with the intention of uh, pursuing a writing career. Okay. Uh, but then I got into, uh, uh, you know, social service, politics. So only later um, I got time to write. And uh, actually I published my first book of poems in 2018. That is the penning poems? Yeah. So, and then I decided I'll, because I keep writing poetry, poetry is something I really like. Okay. Uh, although I, you know, wanted to write novels. Okay. So writing was always at the back of my mind and uh, I didn't find time that then, then I realized that I should make time. Yeah. So I cultivated a discipline. Okay. So while cultivating a discipline, I managed to produce three book of poems in three years time. Okay. Then the pandemic happened. So I had to wait for some time. Yeah. And uh, of course, I brought out uh, my third book of poems, uh, Sling Stones, Sling Stone. Rupa publication. Yeah. It's available at the JLF. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and on Amazon. And uh, Amazon, Amazon places, of course, yeah. 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 But uh, this was written uh, particularly because a lot of people, especially ask us about uh, the Battle of Kohima. True. Because it was a very important battle. Definitely. And, and uh, a lot of uh, people from India served the British Army True. in the Second uh, World War, especially in the Battle of Kohima and Battle of Imphal. Yeah. Uh, and a lot of so books. did my grandfather. Yeah. I mean, not in the Battle of Kohima, but he was uh, part of the British Army. Yes. Yes. So he, he didn't serve in a lot of Europe and other places. Yeah. So they went all over. All over. Yeah. yeah because uh, British employed. A lot of uh, Indians, Indians in the British uh, army. army, and um, you would find that in Kohima there's a big uh, World War II cemetery, yeah. and especially people who died in the Second World War and also the Battle of Kohima, yeah. especially. Now uh, it is the biggest landmark in a town like Kohima where I grew up. Yeah. So sometimes when you look at this, you see that uh, you see that uh, this is a permanent feature of the city yeah. which defines you True. but you would want to know more about the history of course then when you read books yeah. it's usually the british journalists authors or you know uh, descendants of the british army okay. who will write so it's essentially their version of the story it's essentially their version and yeah. it's essentially you know sometimes uh, downplays the role the exactly. nagas played and yeah. or the natives played or the natives played yeah and uh, I felt that all the books I read glorified, uh, you know, their own uh, yeah. prowess mostly. And uh, of, of course, because uh, the version of Japanese uh, is not so accessible to us because oh. written Japanese. Language. Yeah. So there are only a few books to, uh, that we can access. But then I thought, why not write a history of the Battle of Kohima to, from our yeah. perspective? Yeah. But then if you have to write, you have to give the colonial context as well. Of course. Yeah. So from the first time that the British uh, Arrives. East India Company came in contact with the Nagas yeah. to the establishment of Kohima as the political headquarter of uh, the Naga Hills by the British. That was roughly like it took around 50 odd years? Uh, 57 years. 57 years. Uh, I mean it took actually 46 years oh. but the establishment took more than that. Oh. So anyway, I wanted to write uh, about that version by introducing certain aspects of our um, you know, way of life, which is both cultural and historical. Yeah. And uh, because there's no written record, we had only the British anthropologist administrator who wrote a lot about the uh, various tribes. Yeah. And therefore, the narrative always seems to be uh, at odds with who we are, yeah. our history, our place in that history. And it was important that we write from our perspective. True. So if you look at, uh, you know, the title itself, yeah. people think it's like, okay, is the king of England. Yeah. Because around the time I wrote uh, both the Second World War and in 1832, 19th century, when they first came, yeah. it was also, uh, they had kings on the uh, throne there in England. Yeah. But if you look at the Second World War, yeah. you had the, uh, in Japan, you had Emperor Hirohito, yeah. His Majesty. Yeah. 
again, you know, uh, it's it's a title which looked at how they saw yeah. the Nagas who were head hunters. Okay, so that's what one of my questions was. Yes, so I'm just it. clarifying it. Yeah, but it was, uh, the subtitle is more interesting. Yeah, and more for many people controversial because I say the siege of Kohima that shaped world was history. Really true. It is definitely really true dead. for me in that sense. I yes, mean, it actually did. Had the uh, the result of that battle turned out a different way, I mean, history would have been different for sure. Uh, for the entire Southeast Asia, at least South the, Asia the as, subcontinent as well, yeah. for sure, yeah. So I think uh, mm -hmm. if the Japanese did not lose the war there, yeah. they were just able to capture. I mean, just move you know, move to Dimapur, Dimapur, where the railway station is. Yeah. So railway station connects. That region from to the whole of India, true, yeah. and they could just send troops and troops to mm -hmm. defeat the British uh, because I think the British won again because of the air support by the American Air Force, mm -hmm. and you know even the uh, resources okay. uh, from starting from oil came from Assam, mm -hmm. labors came from uh, Assam. Of course, that time there was only Assam. Yeah. Yeah, and the Manipur and the uh, Tripuri kingdoms. Um, but if you look at the Battle of Kohima, yeah. the entire Kohima was uh, battered and destroyed by uh, bombs and you yeah. know, uh, uh, the fight. And after having struggled so much, yeah. villagers have to be displaced, villagers, you know, the, the entire populace was displaced, yeah. you know, in and around Kohima. And they were affected by the war. And so many untold stories are there. It impacts your life, it impacts the life of your descendants. Of course, yeah. And rebuilding it took some time. Yeah. So when you have, you, when you're witness to a scale of violence that you've never imagined in yeah. your life, never imagined, never imagined yeah. then imagine the trauma, imagine the impact. The, the psychological the impact. Psychological. On generations. Well, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So people fought and sacrificed and, you know, they gave all the input necessary yeah. for an empire to win a war against another empire. Yeah. And therefore, I felt that their stories have been told. Their officers and soldiers have been glorified. True. They have been given medals which uh, the Naga warriors won't get. Yeah. But we have to tell our side of the story. Absolutely. So this is the first account yeah. from the perspective of a native. Yeah against uh, colonialism, against, uh, you know, uh, the invading or the occupying forces and the role they play in ensuring that they won this important war. So this is something which actually encouraged me and motivated me to write. It is definitely a very magnificent affair, effort in that regard because forget what the British roads. We as Indians haven't really read as much about the Battle of Kohima, as we should. I mean, we have read about all the battles, you know, Plassey, Haldigati, this, that, history going back to like thousand years, and this is pretty recent. Yeah. And I mean, so but for we didn't uh, we didn't really get to read about it as much as we should. So thank you very much for your effort on this, sir. I mean, thank I'm you. sure this will uh, put the spotlight, you know, and more people will get to know of it. And, and I'm happy you read it. Our versions, yeah. Thank <laughs> you. It is a fabulous book, without a doubt. Sir. Yeah. I thoroughly enjoyed it and uh, it sort of educated me on a lot of things which I wasn't really aware of you know, before reading the book. Uh, so, why do you think this particular battle isn't really talked about as much as it should or is it just plain ignorance or is there like, you know, anything that we as a society could have done better to educate our hmm. generations? I think... Um... You wouldn't, you would be surprised yeah. that there would be people from Rajasthan who would have fought in that battle on behalf of the British Empire. Really? Uh, of course, the British Empire. Yeah. Like, had, so, I mean, I'm just trying to say yeah. you know, that um, our textbooks have been so uh, biased, yeah. so unfair yeah. to some of the major battles right. or the stories of uh, the country as a whole. You know, it's not just. Uh, the Battle of Kohima and different parts of uh, India as well. Mm. But when it comes to this very important battle, mm. 
the the fact that uh, it's not so much talked about is because there's not much written about yeah yeah true so you know because we come from uh, the culture of oral tradition we're not used yeah. to writing of course yeah. yeah so i mean it's only now that we are writing mm-hmm. about this and you will find that it has generated a lot of interest in people yeah. and i'm sure that uh, you know this this subject or this particular es- period of history mm-hmm. would be read by uh, students in the universities yeah. so one attempt is also to uh, present uh, the history from our side absolutely and, and enable them to read one of the reasons why it's neglected is because you know sometimes and this was in the past you know the idea of india doesn't cross beyond the you know bangladesh yeah and and that's uh, in the sense that beyond the borders of bangladesh to the northeastern region yeah, so it really didn't strike people yeah. in india that yeah. a battle of this magnitude yeah. was fought yeah. where the british empire secured a victory because if you look at the status of the british empire at that point of time they were on the decline yeah no i mean they were on their way out and, and also on their way out, way out yeah. but this battle also ensured that they had some you know sense of uh, congratulatory pride restored yeah. you know but americans actually helped because the americans okay. were on the revenge mode yeah after the japanese attacked them in the pearl harbor, pearl harbor yeah. so you know all these are connected yeah of course yeah. and and it, it, those are allied forces exactly yeah. and it's a battle which actually transformed the entire south east asian dynamics yeah Uh, but it's not of concern here because that time there was a huge discussion on um uh, you know uh the independence true and the movement was strong but the british you know uh, were good at propaganda they yeah. ensured that subhash chandra bose indian national army yeah. was called the japanese indian yeah. national army they brigaded him as a rebel yeah and because uh, of that he was uh, you know uh, sort of i mean they they tried to portray him as enemy of the mm-hmm. you know british empire and of course he was and he was i mean yeah. he was probably yeah. so but well, he, he was respected by the japanese yeah. you know, and uh, and the uh, ina led by him fought with the japanese yeah yeah i read so that. Yeah. i mean that part of history people don't want to get into right yeah. now but then you know it's history it's yeah. history you might yeah. like it not like yeah. it it might serve or not serve our propaganda or our you know narrative yeah. but it is what it is it is what it is yes. and uh, you know a lot of people people who died soldiers who died yeah. were not just from nagaland yeah they were from punjab yeah. they were from yeah. south india from maybe even from rajasthan yeah. so i think Oh uh, we tend to forget but a lot of that second world war period yeah is of course uh, overshadowed by the um, uh, partition story yeah the freedom movement freedom and movement partition and, and therefore not much is covered yeah but it is high time yeah that we look into some of the greatest battles that impacted the history of india Absolutely. and this is one such battle yeah and it is a uh, battle fought on the soil and and uh, our soil but the story from our perspective is what matters to me because it tells our story where uh, as in the past it has been ignored yeah. or it has not been told uh, one question that i have of course you interest that that in the book but uh, for the audience um how did nagas or the native population ended up fighting along with the british i mean not till very long ago they were fighting the british and then they ended up fighting along with the british you know fighting the japanese so how did that happen to be in what sort of caused that that's a good question yeah. from 1832 when they uh... survey the road here yeah. which is now part of asian highway 1 yeah. or national highway 2 yeah. there were skirmishes yeah uh, but because uh, villages were attacked burned many nagas died for 46 years you call it the anglo konoma konoma being one of the villages which led the camping against the british yeah. or the anglo naga war it's uh, 
story of 46 years of bloodshed with the British. It is not just other parts of India whose stories are well chronicled and told. But in this region of India, there was a resistance, a rebellion and a war fought against the British Empire. There was no aspiration for glory or, you know, uh, aspiration to over no, putting over your name in the annals of exactly. history, nothing like that. Nothing like that. It's just protection of our land. Protection. So, and fearless, in spite of the weaponry they had, you know, superior weaponry they had. You know, we were using our dows and spears, yeah. primitive weapons, yeah, but we were successful in many of our attempts. Yeah. So, you know, I, I especially laud those uh, warriors of those times who have actually challenged the mighty empire. Um, and uh, when they established the administrative headquarters, they changed their policy. British uh, actually changed a lot of policy towards the uh, Nagas, yeah. and uh, especially towards the communities on the margins or the borderlands there. Okay. Now, over a period of time, they cultivated certain relations. Yeah. So when you are in relation, then you uh, earn trust not of the entire community, but at least some of the people that you work with. True. So when the Japanese came, yeah. they were also friendly. Yeah. They were trying to use a race card, saying that we look uh, alike. Like you. Uh, so, you know, you, we are same people, yeah. so you should support us. Mm -hmm. So initially, there were people who supported them. Yeah. And then uh, there was one Naga leader also who supported the, yeah. the Japanese because he was offered or promised okay. uh, the hope of independence after, you know, okay, after they the take over. The is over. Yeah, after the battle is over. Uh, but... Uh, later on, when they realized that Japanese were in uh, short supply of uh, ammunition and okay. Russian food, Russian and all that, and they started harassing the locals. Okay, that's when the tide changed. That's when the people realized that no, these people are uh, equally bad, and uh, we should change sides because the. You know, Allied forces offered them rations. Yes. Uh, there was uh, uh, the Air Force dropping food and they were sharing the food with our people. Local villages people. were burned or, you know, attacked. Mm. So it was a simple case of winning their hearts. Got it. And it was as simple as that because our, uh, our people are innocent and yeah. simple and uh, the way of the world was very basic at that point of time. Mm. So, you know, that sort of tilted uh, the support of Nagas in the favor of the Allied and the British forces. Okay. So that's how they came to support them as porters, as intelligence gatherers, as mm. even as employed uh, soldiers, mm -hmm. and all sorts of help that, you know, because uh, they're not used to fighting in that terrain. Yeah. And the locals will know the terrain mm -hmm. better than mm -hmm. the others. So they were supported uh, majorly by that. Okay. And if you read my book, you will know in detail what kind of support they yeah. gave, oh. what kind of support they gave yeah. to the British uh, forces. I read the book and I, of course, recommend it to everybody to read it. Yeah. So for to, to have a detailed yeah. you know, a knowledge of what all uh, conspired there and what all happened. It's a fabulous read, honestly. I mean, I have so read something yeah. as good in recent times. Yeah. Um, to your writing process, I mean, how exactly do you go about writing? Is there a process or it just naturally flows? Or I mean, it's something we uh, learn over the years through experience. Uh, you, you cultivate a habit. Yeah. So it's about discipline. Yeah. Yeah. Because writing a book is one of my aspirations. Yeah, one yeah. of my goals that someday I will be a published author. I mean, there are different uh, genres. You, If you write poems, it's different. Okay. If you write a novel, it's different. You've done both. So uh, you could tell. Yeah, you. but oh, okay. a history book is something where Research. You need to do a lot of research, research yeah. both uh, primary, secondary, and then, you know, your field work has to be thorough. Um, and then... Uh, you being based out of that place where this actually happened, the subject, yeah, yeah. did it help? It definitely helped because, yeah. you know, some of the stories are You've stories. Grown up. Yeah. It's, it's uh, handed over to you through oral tradition, tradition, you know. So you learn, you hear stories, and then you want to uh, verify the yeah. stories you've heard. True. So those due processes are followed. Yeah. So it takes discipline to write, but you need to do your research first. Yeah. Once your research is done, yeah. and you take notes, and you refer to your 
both your notes and your books and also you know if you want to confirm then you go and start talking to people so there are various aspects of it which uh, you have to follow it's uh, on the whole hard work and you need dedication and commitment to write true because again it's time taking it's a long long journey and yeah it's a long journey it yeah. takes a lot of commitment over a mm. long period of time yes to sustain that is is a little bit of what i feel will be challenging for me as and when i attempt it because somehow i am not that good with you know, long term commitments so maybe i'll have to work on that uh, there's a question which is a little bit on the personal side i mean you may choose to not answer it so in one of your interviews i read that one of your books is about uh, your conversations with your wife when she was diagnosed with a terminal illness those are like very personal kind of conversations so why did you choose to publish it like what was your thought as in like did it help you process your loss i ask this because my mother i lost my mother 5 years back mm. and i have till date not been able to process that mm. i mean so was writing helpful like putting your thoughts onto paper was it helpful or i don't know i think writing by itself is cathartic it enables you to understand and deal with a uh, grief there's no solution to grief uh, only time is the only healer and um, so i feel that that was one way of helping myself but the other two was uh, other main reason was when uh, my wife died my kids were very young they had barely they barely knew their mother but if i record that true yeah. some point uh, in time at some point of it. time they'll read it and they'll un- identify yeah. so that was one of the reasons which yeah. made it urgent for me yeah to to write that yeah. so it's uh, not really i'm mean, the form i took was a uh, the form of conversations yeah. so it'll mostly be from that perspective that i wrote and uh, yeah i mean it helps it it does help so over the years i've gone back to it again and again i feel that uh, it's a conversation which i might or some parts of it i might forget therefore i wanted to record it to call it yeah. yeah but then i felt that it should be in public domain yeah. i should not keep it to myself and so i published it okay yeah right. and which book is that pen me poem send me poem yeah right so pen me is the name of my late wife so on it sir it's called the pen me okay. poems yeah thank you so with this we have come to the end of this amazing conversation with you sir thank you thank you very much for taking your time out uh coming to our little studio and we definitely i definitely enjoyed the conversation and i'm sure this will be a great value add to the audience this will also um educate them about this wonderful book of yours and so that they can you know, learn more about uh, our own history from our own um, perspective uh, this book is available of course at jlf but more conveniently for people watching from all over india at amazon it's a beautiful read my personal recommendation do read it thank you very much sir. thank you thank you for it